Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be uh, here uh, again, uh, I think the second time. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your interest in foreign affairs and for taking part in the Great Decisions program. Uh, the, the Great Decisions is implemented in this state by an organization called Global Minnesota, on whose board I, I serve. Uh, its mantra is um, bringing the world to Minnesota and Minnesota to the world. It hosts, it does this Great Decisions program, it hosts many uh, public uh, programs um, in, around the Twin Cities. It has a classroom program in, in about 60 different schools around the, the, the metropolitan area. Uh, it hosts about 500 uh, international visitors for the State Department and other U.S. government agencies, people brought here to learn about our country, or more, more frankly speaking, to make friends for our country. This is, it's a terrific, uh, it's a terrific organization. I would encourage you to, um, to check out its website, globalminnesota.org, and uh, that is the end of my, uh, of my advertisement. Um, the topic to today is uh, energy, um, it's given to us as U.S. foreign policy and petroleum. I broadened it a little bit, energy and U.S. foreign policy. Energy, of course, is essential to the world uh, that we live in, to uh, how we travel, uh, uh, what we eat in our homes, uh, in our jobs, uh, etc. Um, and there's a, there's a conversation that some may want to have about uh, whether our reliance on oil and gas is a good thing or a bad thing, or about carbon footprints and things like that. That's a different talk that I am not the most expert in giving. If, uh, if that's interesting and if people have uh, thoughts they wish to offer up, I would encourage you to do so. My remarks are going to focus on uh, really two things. One is what is happening in the world of energy and, and in global, um, the global economy of, of energy, political economy of energy. And then a little bit about some of the ways in which energy issues intersect with American foreign policy. Um, as the introduction noted, um, I'm, a, I'm a diplomat, a career diplomat. Uh, I dealt with energy issues in the second uh, Clinton administration, a senior position at the State Department, having to do with energy in the former Soviet states. Uh, and, in, and in Azerbaijan, energy was probably the issue. Azerbaijan, uh, one of the one of the first countries in the world to become a major producer of, of oil and, and trader of oil in the early 1900s. And, uh, but I'm not an engineer, I don't have, I'm not deeply versed in energy, uh, energy technicalities. Um, I, what I want to do is, is start by talking about what some observers call an energy uh, revolution. Um, a sweeping changes that have been developing over the past decade and arguably are still accelerating in energy supply, energy demand, in technology and renewables, part of, of course, of, of both supply and demand, and trade, energy trade. So let's start with the supply side. Um, many of us here, most of us are probably of about the same generation. We remember very well the shock of the 1973-74 Arab oil boycott. Um, that uh, uh, period of change, I'm sorry, that uh, period of change from, from the era of cheap gasoline that we remember in the 1950s and 60s, made Americans, that episode of, of energy shortages during the boycott, made Americans aware of the limits of the idea that our world and its resources are at some point finite. And, and I think uh, certainly in, 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 the, in my generation, we, we grew up with the idea that increasing scarcity and our dependence on foreign sources would become larger, if not dominant, uh, features of our energy future. And I think that was still a very current idea even just a couple of years ago, and of course for, for many people it may still be. In the last decade, a newfound energy abundance snuck up on us. New oil and gas has come on stream all over the world, led by a radical increase in our own oil and gas production. U.S. oil output has nearly doubled since 2008, it's eight years putting us back among the top oil producers uh, in the world. This is translated into a reduction 
from uh, or a reduction in oil imports from about 60% of our consumption in 2006 to just one quarter today. Nobody, <coughs> if this had been a forum on energy 10 years ago, nobody would have predicted that that would happen. That we would ever again get such a small share, a quarter, of our, of our oil uh, from foreign sources. The output of natural gas in the United States over the same period has risen 35%, making our country the number one natural gas producer in the world. Most, export, most experts predict the U.S. gas production will continue uh, to increase. Whereas only a decade ago we were planning to import liquefied natural gas, we recently began to export it. And in December 2015, Congress lifted uh, the ban on uh, crude oil sales out of the United States to other countries that have been in place for 40 years. This burst of, of new production has not happened because of great big new finds in the United States or big changes in U.S. policy. The drivers are the market and entrepreneurship, plus horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing or fracking, and the application of information and other new technologies to the oil and gas business. Fracking, of course, has led to some concerns about uh, groundwater quality and earthquakes where they didn't seem to belong, particularly in Oklahoma. Be that as it may, these new technologies and techniques have significantly lowered production costs, increased rates of recovery, made, it, made economical fields uh, that previously just seemed way too costly. People knew about, but seemed too costly to develop. Our oil and gas revolution uh, has been bolstered by increased output in Canada, which has doubled its oil output since 2000 and become the number one exporter or source of, 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 uh, of our imported oil in the world. It's not Saudi Arabia, it would be Canada. And Mexico, now our third largest uh, supplier of imported oil. They, in a long list of non-OPEC, non-Arab countries, have greatly changed the global energy landscape, including uh, our own contribution to that. Think 50 to $60 a barrel for oil versus, say, 150 that, that seemed to be what people expected only, uh, only five, six, seven years ago. And I think, to me, this is illustrated by this uh, eye chart, the first of a couple that I have. The, the green is the United States, skyrocketing oil production, um, getting up to nearly, you know, not that far from the level of Saudi Arabia, which is the orange, not, not far below the level of Russia. Um, a, a dramatic change after decades, uh, or years and years and years of steady decline, and that's just on the oil side. This revolution in energy supply is matched by uh, uh, quite significant changes in energy demand and the pattern of energy demand away from the developed world in favor of developing countries, especially China and India. Um, so Increases of, of output in the United States uh, and some other developing countries notwithstanding, the demand for oil is declining virtually everywhere in the developed world. American and, and European Union consumption of oil has fallen by over 10% since their peak in 2006. Japan's oil consumption peaked in 2004. The International Energy Agency, or IEA, projects that in the two plus decades to 2040, Oil consumption will decline annually in the United States by about 1%, 1.7% in the EU, 2.4% in Japan. You add those annual amounts, and after 23 years, that's going to amount to quite, uh, quite a significant reduction. That's not a reduction of growth. That is a reduction. Oil, of course, will remain important in our economy. Few alternatives for oil exist in, in for example, uh, road, the road freight business, in aviation, in petrochemicals. There's also a matter of inertia. Big, expensive power systems that depend on oil uh, get used a long time before they get swapped out. But change is definitely on its way. 
And I, and I love this picture of the economist, roadkill, or the death of the internal combustion engine. Um, the, the days of the, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the internal combustion engine, of course, maybe never at all, of my guess is it's a big one. Um, but I think this is, a, this is an illustration of, our, or, or a, 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 a fact that is driving changes in, uh, in demand for energy in the developed world. On a macro level, low rates of economic growth and efficiency gains match against trends elsewhere suggest that the developed world, which accounted for over half of the world's energy consumption prior to 2006, will never, will never play that dominant role. And it's not just a dominant role in sucking up a lot, a lot of energy. It's a dominant role in, in driving and shaping the global market for energy. The developing world looks quite different. IEA research suggests that nearly all of the growth in global energy consumption in the next 20 years will be in the developed world, <coughs> developing world. It will double in Asia, double in Africa, double in the Middle East. The biggest driver will be China, where demand rose 160 percent in uh, the first 14 years of this century. Already, it is the world's largest importer of oil the third largest importer of liquefied natural gas. China will, according to the IEA, overtake the United States as the largest consumer of energy in the early 2030s. India is moving up the energy consumption ladder. It's, for example, its electricity output is projected to more than triple by 2040. Uh, and the largest share of that growth will be coal, which is a resource in, uh, India has. These countries, their energy sectors, and the forces that drive them are starting to play a bigger and bigger role in the global market for energy that will only become more important as the 21st century unwinds. A third revolution has to do with renewables and uh, efficiency improvements, smart energy technologies. Uh, the impact of this whole set of things, notwithstanding a lot of rhetoric, is fairly small on a macro level. For example, solar today accounts for barely 1% of world electricity output, and that's despite a drop in kilo, uh, kilowatt hour per kilowatt hour cost of 40 to 80% over the last five, six, seven years. But the trend lines for renewables and smarter, more efficient energy technologies are just momentous. Uh, they seem to be increasingly driven, not just or mainly by subsidies, which was definitely the case in the early years, but increasingly by the market. The IEA projects that over the next two decades, nearly 60% of all new power generating capacity will come from renewables. And we're already on track for that. In 2015, for the, for the first time, renewables accounted for over half of the new electricity generating capacity uh, installed worldwide. This slide, um, it's the second eye test, uh, is t sort of portrays this. Um, so the brown, the, sort of the brown down here, that would be geothermal. The green is solar, so you can see it's coming up a little bit above essentially zero on a global scale. The gold is wind, and, and you know, if you go back even to 2008, it's coming up quite, quite significantly. The blue is hydro, which goes up and down depending on the season. And the red is biomass. Biomass in develop, developed economies means garbage. Uh, biomass in developing countries means trees. As the slide suggests, the, the, the big piece there is biomass, or the big two pieces are biomass and, uh, and hydro, rapidly growing wind power sector. The European Union set a goal in 2009 that 20% of its energy consumption should come from renewables. By 2020, it was 2020, 20. that was the, what they, the jazzy name they gave to this. And last year, almost 90% of the new power capacity installed in Europe was renewable. That means for Europe, uh, European uh, usage of energy, 
big energy bills, high investment costs that go, that go along, if that's what you're going to do, uh, adding to the European Union's uh, various economic and political headaches. Then there's China. A May 2017 headline in National Geographic, Geographic put the country's energy priorities very succinctly. I love this quote. It, it's headline, three reasons to believe China's renewable energy boom. It has, <clears throat> it has atrocious air pollution. It fears climate change. And it wants to be a manufacturing monster, in quote, in renewable. There, there's some reasons for that, and that and that, um, that air pollution set of issues was was a, a big driver. So this is uh, CO two emissions from uh, a, a few different countries. The one that's that's coming off the chart there that would be China. The Chinese leaders determined to try to deal with this, and so to that end. Uh, uh, China aims to get 20% of its power from renewables by 2030, up from about 12% today. Uh, to get there, in 2016, the country installed 35 gigawatts of new solar generating capacity. Now, I'm not an engineer. I, I kind of know a gigawatt is a lot. 35 gigawatts is equivalent to the total solar capacity of Germany, total ever installed in the last 10 years or so that Germany has been working on solar. China does that, that same quantity in one year. As for the United States, about 10% of our overall energy consumption and about 15% of electricity generation comes from renewables according to the IEA. At an earlier talk in this series that I gave elsewhere in the Twin Cities, one of the participants said that Minnesota is a little bit ahead of that, around 18 to 20 percent uh, of uh, of our of our electricity uh, comes up, comes from renewable sources. Uh, the United States produces more geothermal and bio, biomass power than any other country. We're the second largest uh, power producer from wind. We're the third third largest in hydropower, fourth largest in solar. We're making we've made quite significant investments. Uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency, uh, which is a kind of club of, of um, a club of certain countries, uh, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure if the United States is part of it, projects that by 2030 the share of renewables in total U.S. energy mix could reach 27 percent, or 700 gigawatts, more than a six-fold increase. That scale. To a lot of people, uh, to a lot of economists, it seems unlikely given the Trump administration's energy priorities, which will be important for the next four years at least. The stupendous investment costs associated with that kind of uh, transformation, and our relative abundance of cheap oil and gas. Uh, but even conservative estimates predict that this renewable sector will double or triple uh, in uh, in the course of the next uh, in the next uh, 13, 14 years. Um, getting renewables into our and the world's energy mix um, will be a big deal and requires many things to make it work. And this slide is one illustration of this. In every market, structural changes in how power systems are designed and operated will be required to, 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 to accommodate renewables on a large scale. Local or individual homeowners, one thing, but on a large uh, quasi-industrial scale, something else. Uh, wind and solar power, uh, uh, so wind and solar supply power at varying levels. Uh, and the grid's got to deliver electricity all the time. That means batteries. Renewables. Uh, sorry, that, uh, 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 that means power storage. It may, may or may not be a battery. There are a variety of ways you can store power. Um, but uh, Tesla investing big time. The other uh, slide, those are giant batteries. They're, they're the shape and size of a semi-trailer uh, uh, and uh, that will become increasingly important. Goldman Sachs predicts that the demand for lithium used in rechargeable batter batteries and energy storage systems will triple by 2025. Credit Suisse estimates that demand will outstrip supply in just a couple of years. 
If you're an investor, lithium might be a good field. Australia, Chile, and Argentina, the world's largest producers of lithium, may become kind of super players in the energy economy of tomorrow. So the developments I've talked about all mean changes in the pattern of trade and therefore the governance of the energy sector. One big set of trade-related change comes in the area of natural gas, uh, where, where something is developed a, a kind of the world's first ever truly global market in gas. In yesterday's economy, trade, international trade in gas meant huge upfront investments in development and especially in fixed pipelines to get the stuff from here to there. Uh, and, uh, and, and deals that were done on fixed contracts with fixed prices, but or, or arrangements anyway, between producers and, uh, and buyers. The market was so narrow and so mm, not really functional that the prices of internationally traded gas were based on the price of oil and by a mathematical formula. Today, an increasing share of international traded gas is based not on long-term contracts, but on the spot market. And it's delivered not by pipeline, but by tanker. This spot market trade means choice for consumers and also choice for suppliers. Competition then establishes a real price. And this, that old practice of basing gas price on oil prices, that's falling away. Consumers locked into those long-term fixed contracts, now using the fact of this spot market to negotiate down the prices that they have been paying for years. More importantly, previously inaccessible but potentially quite profitable markets all around the world now abound for producers of gas in places like Australia, Tanzania, Egypt, Argentina, and the United States. It will be these that that those price and profit making opportunities uh, will will in essence drive abundance abundant supplies of gas further in the years to come. A second trade related change is in the Middle East, where three decades or maybe more than three decades of uh, growing spending on desalination plants, on electric power, on economic development, and meant rising demand which the IA estimates will double over the next 20 years, squeezing the oil imports that the Middle East has to put into the broader global energy market. A Middle East exporting much less oil becomes, looms less large in the world. And indeed, some pundits have raised some questions. If the Middle East is or is becoming less important and or if we're going to be less reliant on it uh, for our economic well-being, can we or should we reconsider our defense and security posture in the Middle East? Or, given that Asia, and especially China and India, will become the ones that are uh, most directly dependent on the energy that the Middle East can, does continue to export, why shouldn't they shoulder the security, political, and other burdens in the region? I think there'll be growth, growth industries in both, on both of those topics. Finally, uh, and most important in market and geopolitical terms is that rise of Asia that I referred to earlier. And actually, this, this isn't quite the rise of Asia. This, uh, uh, this is total energy demand, primary energy demand. The blue, that's the developed world. It isn't changing a whit between now and 2035. The gray is the developing world, skyrocketing in, in, in its importance and its dominance in the market. In those, among the developing countries, China, India, and Asia are the gigantic new market for energy producers. Uh, and this has big implications for how the international trading system, how the, the for the international governance uh, in the energy sector will work. America's oil and gas industry got real interested in Asia when, a few years ago, Energy costs in, in the Far East generally ran two to three times uh, the pr price, the cost of energy in the United States. Producers saw tremendous opportunities to make a whole lot of money on the difference between our and Asia's prices. Others are after the Asian market too. Canada's Prime Minister recently approved a pipeline to the Pacific uh, for marketing oil to Asia. Uh, pipelines from Kazakhstan and Russia to China mirror this, as does the prospect of a pipeline from Central Asia 
uh, down to energy starved India and Pakistan. Renewables are also part of this. There are developers and, spe and specialists in energy efficiency technologies panting to be part of that energy, uh, uh, renewable energy binge that China's engaged in. <coughs> My point is that these countries will dominate future in, in consumption and investment. A market constitutes a kind of governance, and it's fair to say that Asia, Asia will increasingly determine global oil and gas prices, what fuels and sources of power generation will grow and stagnate, the nature of relations between consumers and suppliers, and whether the world can effectively address climate change. We could talk more about energy, um, and I'm sure many of you have perspectives to add on the, on the strictly energy side, but I want to turn to the foreign policy side. A, a, a former colleague of mine in government, Carlos Pascual, uh, wrote uh, a couple of years ago, energy and geopolitics have always been closely linked. The 20th century saw access to energy resources become a major factor in determining the winners of wars, oil producers banding together to create new global alliances, and price swings that spurred or deterred the adventurism of superpowers. I want to illustrate this by talking about Japan, the Arab oil boycott, U.S. energy policy in the former Soviet Union, where I, I, I have to talk about that because I used to do that, and wrap up with North Korea and some thoughts about foreign policy generally. So uh, Pasquale's point is, um, I think, uh, very well illustrated. His point about winners of wars, uh, or maybe just wars, well illustrated by the Roosevelt administration's decision in July 1941 to ban U.S. oil exports to Japan after its forces overran Indochina. Japan at that time was importing 90% of its oil, 60% of its oil from the United States. So this was not a trivial matter at all. The Secretary was so not trivial that the Secretaries of State and Navy opposed this decision to embargo oil to Japan as tantamount to a declaration of war. It may have been the right step in terms of uh, Japan's aggression. The United States may not have had as much choice. It was obviously a very serious step to take, to say the least. Could you say one more time what, what the year was that we put the ban on Japan? 1941. July 1941. So uh, five months before Pearl Harbor. Um, then there's the uh, boycott. 1973, Arab member states of OPEC embargoed <coughs> oil exports to the United States in retaliation for Washington's decision to resupply the Israeli military during the 1973 Arab-Israeli War. Uh, to remind ourselves of what happened then, the price of oil doubled and then quadrupled imposing skyrocketing costs on energy, on consumers all around the world, huge structural changes for economies all around the world to deal with this uh, big shift in, in the energy bill. America's policy response, we can remember this part too, was not always a pretty sight. Uh, remember how much we liked the 55 mile an hour speed limit. Um, but it did include the creation of the Department of Energy to give coherence to our energy policy making, the establishment of a strategic petroleum reserve, uh, which I read uh, just was, was tapped into just a few weeks ago in the context or in the aftermath of the hurricane uh, in, uh, uh, that struck Houston. Serious R&D investments in energy technology and efficiency that, it, you know, as you look, look back at, at some of the changes that's taken place uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, that's where, that's where a lot of it started and the inauguration of the International Energy Agency, a kind of consuming energy's strategic counter to OPEC on the, uh, on the production side. More importantly, over time, our and other market economies adjusted. Price hikes, investments, changing patterns of trade in our countries. And over time, uh, the Arab boycotters came to realize that beyond a certain point, 
their tactics not only failed to bring about the policy changes they, they had in mind, our policy didn't change, toward Israel didn't change a whip, uh, but also set in motion many things contrary to their interests. Those market forces, again. Today's much less universal OPEC that has a much smaller share uh, of uh, world, world uh, uh, oil and gas output, less adversarial than it used to be. So the third piece uh, in which I was involved followed the collapse of the Soviet Union. U.S. policymakers from uh, President Bush, 41, and Clinton on down gave a lot of attention to supporting the sovereignty and, ind and independence of each of the new states that emerged after the Soviet Union collapsed. The premise, among other things, was that the USSR had represented the primary threat to our way of life for four, over 40 years, and ensuring against its resurrection uh, was important. And so the survival and the success of these new countries would be good for American interests. Um, oil and gas were a big part of these efforts. Um, Azerbaijan, where I served, where the international oil industry began in, uh, in the early 1900s, led by Nobel and Rothschild, for example. Uh, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan's oil, oil output in that period uh, surpassed that of the United States in that period. Uh, remains an important energy producer. Uh, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, massive energy oil and gas deposits. Turkmenistan, I think, has the second or third largest gas uh, reserves in the world. So uh, for their leaders and for American policymakers, those energy resources were a kind of a godsend uh, that, of, of resources they could use to stand up their new, uh, their new countries, their new state institutions, develop their economies, provide some kind of viable future for their citizens. Of course, this was, you know, in the early 1990s, it was still very much the age of energy scarcity and decline. Getting new resources to market was also part of the deal for us. Maybe not, maybe it's only a couple percent added to global energy, to the global energy market, but a couple percent makes, uh, can make a difference. Um, so the whole story of energy development in this part of the world is long and tedious. I want to just highlight pipelines. This is, I think this is the last eye test. So uh, Azerbaijan's oil and gas, we uh, put a lot of time and attention to developing this pipeline, which, which has been built, to the Turkish Mediterranean coast. It's a Mediterranean sea down there. Uh, it carries, I think it's now uh, one and a half um, one and a half million barrels a day uh, to international markets. This, the other pipeline that's important is this one, which runs from Kazakhstan's uh, North Caspian uh, oil, uh, oil uh, fields across Russia to the Black Sea, where the product can be put in tankers and, and sent on its way through the, through the Turkish Straits and out to the world economy. Pipelines were essential to get the resources of these kind of landlocked countries developed and delivered to market. The pre-existing pipelines, which are some of those other lines on that, on that map, uh, were few, small in capacity, and went through Russia, which had no interest in competition. A bad alternative, and you can see this, this line here, a bad alternative was Iran, also a competitor and not very interested. And oh, by the way, even then we had a pretty, uh, a pretty tough agenda as, as far as uh, uh, Iran was concerned. So the United States gave a whole, a great deal of backing to new pipelines from the Caspian to the Black and Mediterranean seas. Each one of these involved getting, uh, uh, involved many countries, getting governments to agree with one another and with many different private businesses who, of course, were paying the bills, not taxpayers, either, either here or elsewhere, was and still is very big business. Um, and though there are plenty of things that have gone wrong in this part of the world, uh, including for American ministers, it's been good for our interest that Kazakh, Azeri, Turkmen oil and gas got developed, that the pipelines got necessary to bring that production to the market got built, and at least the beginnings of statehood for these new countries uh, have, uh, has, have, have been created there. 
A fourth case study is Iran. Energy and energy diplomacy played an essential role in the, the, the strategy that led uh, the United States and other uh, uh, great powers to persuade Iran to conclude the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that froze and partially unwound that country's nuclear program. The prerequisite was uh, a UN Security Council consensus, that is to say the support of Russia and China, on a strategy to ward away, to ward Iran away from its nuclear efforts. With that consensus in hand, and backed by measures that denied access to US and European financial markets for entity, entities around the world importing oil from Iran, our diplomats went to work. They convinced buyers of Iranian oil, China, India, Southeast Asian countries, African countries, others, to, as we put it politely at the time, consider how over-reliance on Iran made them vulnerable, and how they could diversify their sources of supply in other directions. As a result of American-led diplomacy in this period, and we were the pushers, every major importer of Iranian oil responded by cutting its purchases 15 to 20 percent. This plus a lowering of prices in 2014-15 cut off at its peak $5.7 billion a month in Iranian earnings from energy. A shortfall that crippled their economy proved to be crucial leverage for getting Tehran to agree to contain its nu nuclear program in exchange for sanctions relief. As some of you likely are, are aware, the Trump administration uh, several months ago proposed something akin to this, a international oil embargo of North Korea as a way to pressure the, the North Koreans, the premise being that their almost complete lack of domestic energy resources would more or less force them to, uh, uh, to the negotiating table on its nuclear program. And that may generally be one of the lines on which uh, the United States should work, although it, as in the case of Iran, it, it, can't, it has to be part of a strategy with a number of other elements, uh, and uh, developed and pursued uh, with as many other of the world, uh, as many other world powers, not to mention energy uh, producers, as possible. Uh, and on the oil side, uh, for example, a, a strategy like this would need to assess North Korea's suppliers, how they can be brought into a coalition to stop or at least reduce uh, their energy sales, oil and gas sales to North Korea, how to raise the cost uh, to North Korea of buying them. Um, there are a variety of other issues there as well. And this leads to uh, my last point, and then I'm happy to take your questions, comments, uh, which is more foreign policy than energy specific. Whether the issue is North Korea or Iran curbing greenhouse gas emissions, or very nearly anything else that really matters to the United States in international affairs, the essential pieces almost always involve incisive, fact-based analysis, well thought out, comprehensive, and multifaceted strategies that bring to bear our power and our influence, strong and effective partners appropriate to the task, including sometimes partners we don't like. To put it another way, statecraft, that's what we're talking about. Statecraft in today's world means not just, say, deploying a bunch of ships to a certain part of the world or making a telephone call or a tweet, but serious strategies that relate a problem as it in fact is what we want to achieve, and the tools we have or can obtain to achieve our goals. It depends not on one man, but on a team. Um, to come back to where we started, I was honored to have been part of a cadre of about four, 4,500 or so 
officers who work on the front lines of America's diplomatic and security presence abroad and at the State Department, uh, along with the military and our uh, intelligence agencies, the Foreign Service, the American Foreign Service, a key part of the cadre of foreign affairs professionals that has made U.S. foreign policy competitive, effective, transformative, and incredibly successful for the last 70 years. The Foreign Service, our diplomacy, and our nation's foreign policy today, and this is my second and last commercial, are being challenged by an almost willful dis disregard for diplomacy as a tool of uh, national security and foreign policy by, by uh, planned funding cuts of one-third by deliberate understaffing at the State Department, uh, at the State Department's senior levels and some of our embassies over uh, abroad, by a hiring freeze that if it continues for long will hobble our diplomatic core. Extremely negative developments that I think all of which will affect our country negatively in the years to come. If you, if I've convinced any of you, please find ways to uh, to speak to your elected representatives. With that. I will be happy to uh, end my commercial and respond to your questions and comments.